Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey there, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for a very special webinar on how to use UCAN for endurance training. I'm Varun Sriram. I'll be your host for the next 45 minutes or so, and I'm really, really excited to be joined by a fantastic co-host today. I've got Michelle Hearn along here for the ride with us today. Uh, Michelle is a registered dietitian. She's a marathon runner, quite a fast marathon runner, and she's also worked at a running store, so uh, really kind of the best person to uh, join us. Michelle, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks, Warren. Awesome, Michelle. Well, before we get started, um, give folks a little bit of an idea of who you are as a runner. Um, you know, some of the things uh, without I, I'm giving you the chance to pat yourself on the back. I know you're <laughs> a humble person, but uh, tell tell folks um, what you've been up to uh, yourself in your own running. Okay, so um, I recently moved from Portland, Oregon to the uh, Boulder, Colorado area. So I'm currently training for the uh, Chicago Marathon. I would say the marathon's my main event. Right now I'm kind of in a, you know, uh, getting stronger, doing a little bit shorter, faster stuff. But I was a high school runner. I ran in college. Um, my personal best right now for the marathon is 258. It's my goal to get under 254 this year. Um, and yeah, like you said, you know, I've kind of done the gamut of things. I've worked in a few different running stores. I currently practice as a clinical dietitian at Boulder Community Hospital. But, you know, I've had extensive experience with Generation UCAN, and uh, I love the product. So I'm excited to talk about how I use it in my running and how you can use it in your running. And uh, Michelle, you know, we were definitely going to take a deeper dive into UCAN and some of the um, science, supporting science, um, and really the, the critical role of blood sugar management um, for anybody, whether you're training for endurance or just for daily life. I know that's something that, that you're pretty passionate about. But how did you get turned on to UCAN initially? How did you hear about it and, and why did you start using it? Yeah, you know, it, gosh, I believe it was 2012 or 2013, I saw an ad um, in Le on Let's Run, the website Let's Run, and it claimed this product kept your blood sugar and your energy stable, and, you know, you would able, you'd be able to take 100 calories of product, and it could last you up to 90 minutes of running, and everything I had learned in my dietetic training and um, you know, even diving into running and sports nutrition said that was impossible. So, you know, I started looking at the science and I was just really interested. And I remember thinking, you know, if this, if this product does what they say it does, this is really going to be something unique and special. And so, you know, I ended up getting some samples, deciding to try it. And, you know, I was hooked because I had been using, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but I had been using a lot of the goos and gels and maltodextrin based products and really struggling from the, those energy crashes. So, you know, I was really excited to find something that was unique. Awesome, Michelle. Well, well great background. And, and that's kind of a, a launching point for us um, here today. And, and just want to give a, a little bit of an outline of how this is going to work. So we do want to make this as interactive as possible. I appreciate everybody giving up some of their evening to be with us. So feel free to, to throw questions our way. We'll do our best to um, address all of them over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. And um, you know, we're going to spend about the first 10 or 15 minutes talking about some of the, science, the scientific principles that, that are kind of the fundamental baseline of what UCAN does from a product standpoint. So I think it's important to understand some of that, which, which a lot of you folks will be, might say, hey, this is very different than what I'm reading in, you know, the runner's world or mainstream media, um, but something that's really catching a lot of steam. So we'll spend a little bit of time on that, and then we'll shift more into really the nuts and bolts uh, of how to use UCAN. And I've had a few people ask me, you know, everybody here, some of you have tried it, some of you haven't. You all will be getting samples of UCAN as, as part of being on this session today. And that information will be communicated to you um, via your local retailer who you signed up for this webinar with. So those samples will be available for free um, to pick up at your local specialty retail store next week, early next week. So um, just stay tuned for that. But definitely, uh, all of you here will have an opportunity to try UCAN. So with that being said, Michelle, let's, uh, let's jump right into it. Um, you know, one of the really fundamental principles behind UCAN and, and really everything we're going to talk about today is this idea of blood sugar management and blood sugar control. Michelle, from, from your perspective as a dietitian and as a runner, what's the issue with the way a lot of runners are, have been told to fuel and are fueling today? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we've been taught that we need to consume 
a lot of carbohydrates and a lot of calories. They usually say about two to 300 an hour, um, depending on your weight, you know, before activity, because, you know, we, we have to have that energy to get through activity. And then once you start activity, say once you start running or if you're cycling, whatever you're doing, every 45 minutes, um, you know, to an hour, we need, we need to be taking more carbohydrates and more carbohydrates in order to maintain this, you know, steady energy. And, um, you know, what we found is when you do that, you know, you're constantly at risk for those, as you can see on the graph here, those blood sugar spikes and then blood sugar crashes. And unfortunately, when you consume, you know, a significant amount of carbohydrates right before energy, say, hey, I'm going to go for a run, I'm going to have a bagel right before I run, or I'm going to have, you know, a banana, what happens, you get that blood sugar spike, and then, um, you know, you're setting yourself up for that subsequent crash. So the interesting thing is, you know, when you're describing that that spike and crash in blood sugar, a, a lot of the things that runners commonly have before they go out to, to run or go out to train, whether it's that bagel, that banana, that energy gel, that shot block, whatever you call it, it's really kind of working against you in terms of what you'd want to do to, to maintain your energy levels over a long period of time. Is, is that accurate to say, Michelle? Yeah, absolutely. So you're, you're kind of solving a very short-term problem, but you're creating a really long-term problem. And what I mean by that is, let's say, you know, you have uh, an energy gel or you have, like I said, that bagel. What happens is you're going to have that initial surge of energy, like you can see once again on this graph. But anytime you have that initial surge in blood sugar, you know, your pancreas secretes a hormone called insulin. You know, what insulin does is it basically shuts down your body's ability to use fat for fuel. And that's so important for endurance athletes, you know, even even people who are really lean, even if you're, you know, elite runner, 4%, you know, body fat, most of us have significantly more body fat than that. You know, we have tons of calories of stored fat. And when you have all those carbohydrates before you run, you don't allow your body to utilize that fat for fuel. You know, like I said, your um, pancreas secretes insulin and it really suppresses your body from being able to use fat for fuel. So now you've got two things working against you. You stopped your body from being able to use fat for fuel. And because insulin's coming in, your blood sugar is guaranteed to crash. So for, for companies like, you know, Goo and Gatorade and, and all those quick acting sugar drinks, it's, it's, it's really good marketing. I mean, what a great thing that you're going to have that spike and crash. You, you pretty much have to keep consuming their product in order to, um, to keep your energy stable. But unfortunately, you're taking in a lot of sugar. You're not letting your body use fat. It's a really inefficient way to fuel, and it's really unhealthy to do over a long, a long period of time. You know, it's not, it's not good on your body to be constantly taking in those fast-acting carbohydrates. And you know, never mind the uh, the you know, with everything you talked about. You know, the the implications for gastric distress. I'm sure this is something that that you've been through as a runner uh, with with clients you've worked with. You've seen this, but but this is something we hear time and time again that, you know, that, that sugary drink or gel, you know, might go down good before the race or, or an hour into the race, but two hours in, three hours in, four hours in, a lot of times your stomach just can't handle that. And so I guess all these things are interconnected. You know, if, if you're constantly causing your blood sugar to fluctuate and, and you need this, this fuel, this fast acting carb or the sugar, but at some point your stomach simply says no more then that's where people are going to be prone to bonking, you know? So, so these are all very much intertwined. Um, but another interesting thing, Michelle, uh, you know, there's, there's the perform certainly the performance implications of being a better fat burner, you know, all of your, your very elite and, and top runners, um, are, are all excellent, very efficient fat burners because that's what's needed. Um, you know, especially late in the race for endurance, but how about just the, the weight management or, or fitness implications? You've worked with a lot of runners that are in this to, to get lean and lose weight and, and have struggled with that, um, with the traditional fueling method. How, how is that all related to, to blood sugar control? Yeah, you know, that, that was really interesting to me. I started working with, um, you know, a large group of women who were training for their first marathon. And it really struck me that these women were, you know, running, training some up to 40, 50, you know, first marathon miles a week. And um, reviewing their diets, they certainly weren't eating excessive amounts of calories, but they were really struggling to lose weight. You know, they weren't able, um, you know, to lose fat. I had I had women tell me like, man, I actually gained some, I'm gaining some weight. What in the world is going on? And so what's happening, you know, is when you, when you take in so many carbohydrates before training, during training, and after training, um, you shut down your body's ability to burn fat. You're teaching your body to store fat, store sugar, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do 
um, if you're trying to lose weight. And, and you know, as, as we're going to talk about, it actually has a negative aspect to performance. So a lot of the things we've been taught, you know, have a high carbohydrate before, high carbohydrate during, high carbohydrate after, high carbohydrate throughout the day, they really are counterproductive to, um, to weight loss and certainly to performance as well. And I think that's something, you know, that really struck me too, as we've been to to several, you know, hundreds of expos over the last year as as running is becoming more mainstream and and opening itself up to a a diverse audience. You know, you have people coming into the sport with all different types of goals. And and like you said, Michelle, using the sport as an avenue to get fit and to lose weight. So the nutrition side of things really plays a large part of it. Um, the last one I'll ask you, Michelle, before we move on is, so, you know, you came up as a runner, uh, perhaps traditionally trained and maybe as an RD, uh, traditionally trained. Did it take you a while to, to shift your mindset? Um, because, you know, it's, it's natural when you're hearing something that's counter to what you've been taught and read for years and years and years that you're going to question it for a moment. How long did it take you to open your eyes up to the fact that there might be a better way? And, and maybe what was that epiphany for you? Yeah, you know, um, I I jumped on the bandwagon relatively quickly when I experienced it. You know, I feel like, you know, I'm really glad that we're going to be sending samples to all the uh, all the people listening because it's certainly one thing for, you know, us to to talk about it and to show you the science, but until you really experience it for yourself, I mean, that that took it to an entirely new level for me. So um, I was really struggling training. I was actually training for a half marathon. And I was using a lot of goos and gels and just bonking and workouts. And for the mileage I was running, you know, getting up to 60, 70 miles a week, I wasn't really leaning out. And, um, you know, I, I used UCAN. I got the samples and I used it before an easy run. And it was the first time in quite a while that I'd had no stomach issues. And I felt good. I felt the solid, you know, consistent energy. But I thought, well, you know, it was a shorter run. But then I tried it for an intense run, you know, a, a tempo or, uh, workout. And I felt same thing, felt really great again. And then my final test was for a two hour run and I was able to get through the entire two hour run on one packet of UCAN. And that's when I was, thought, you know, okay, there's really something special about this product. And, uh, but yeah, no, I still, you know, I've been using it for several years and I've, you know, been talking about it, but it's very difficult for, um, you know, the sports community and the dietetics community to, uh, to change, you know, when you've had these, these views and you've been taught the, this information um, you know, I think it's going to take a while for people to kind of change their views. But, you know, after people try it and experience it and, you know, feel the energy, they don't have the stomach issues. And most people, you know, are going to lose some, are going to lean out and lose weight. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't take too long. <laughs> so hopefully uh, with that intro, uh, we've, we've intrigued you enough to say, okay, tell us more. What, what the heck is you can and, and why is it so different than everything else? And then that's what we're about to do. But you know, in summary, you're going to hear us come back to this time and time again, but but blood sugar control or steady blood sugar is really the name of the game. Um, and, and you know, Michelle said it so well, I don't need to, to reiterate it, but it, it's beneficial in so many ways from preventing GI distress to preventing bonking to uh, allowing you to better burn fat, get lean. So that's really the fundamental principle that we're going to be coming back to over and over again today. So let's get a little bit into UCAN and, and you know, understand why it's so different. Um, and part of that is really to understand the story behind UCAN. So what you're seeing here on the uh, screen is our, our founder son, Jonah, who suffers from a very rare blood sugar disease, uh, bl- excuse me, blood sugar disease. So Jonah has something called glycogen storage disease, where from the time he was born, um, he had to be fed every two hours throughout the day, three to four times in the middle of the night, just to stabilize his energy. So Michelle, you could probably um, explain this as a dietitian better than, than I can, but what's the simplest way to, to explain the dilemma that kids with glycogen storage disease face? Yeah, so, you know, glycogen storage disease, it's a, it's a very rare blood sugar processing disease to where, I, how I explain it is, um, you know, when you and I go to bed at night, people with healthy functioning livers, your um, liver releases little bits of stored carbohydrate. It's called glycogen. So your liver releases little bits of glycogen. And what that does is it keeps your blood sugar nice and stable through the evening. So we don't wake up, you know, dizzy, shaky with really low blood sugar. You know, kids born with this disorder, their livers don't do that. They're actually not able to access their own stored liver glycogen. So Jonah and kids, uh, you know, anybody with glycogen storage disease had to be fed carbohydrates every few hours 
throughout the day and into the evening. So, you know, Jonah's family, they would literally set up multiple alarm clocks around the house, you know, wake him up every few hours, make him drink carbohydrates, go back to bed, and they had to be constantly monitoring his blood sugar, or he could get, you know, hypoglycemic, meaning your blood sugar goes extremely low, and to a point where he, you know, would have to be hospitalized. So this was really, uh, uh, you know, of course, like Michelle described, a huge, huge uh, dilemma for the family, very stressful uh, life and, and, you know, always a life by the clock. There's a documentary actually on YouTube called Life by the Clock that details the dilemma specifically of Jonah's family and, and other families that have kids with this condition. So Jonah's family, they were very proactive. In 2000, they set up a foundation and, and they started um, really spearheading a lot of research. Um, and what they were basically trying to find was a nutritional solution to this issue. So they were looking for something that would alleviate the day-to-day stresses on their lives because, you know, gene therapy, things of that nature, a a cure, that was years and years and years down the road, you know. Um, So what Jonah's family did is they started uh, working with uh, some of the top carbohydrate researchers in the world, and and they were basically looking for what they term the world's best carbohydrate. And, And in their context, this is something that would break down slowly and steadily over time and maintain stable blood sugar levels for a long period of time. At the very least, what they wanted to do is find something that they could give to Jonah prior to sleeping at night that would stabilize his blood sugar and stabilize his energy throughout the night so they at least didn't have to wake up and feed him at night. Um, So you know, they really looked at everything. They looked at all different types of starches, grains, uh, barley, uh, you know, you name it. Pretty much every carbohydrate, or not pretty much, all carbohydrate sources were evaluated in an effort to find something that stabilized blood sugar for the longest period of time. And eventually what they found was that starting with non-GMO cornstarch, that's non-genetically modified cornstarch, they put it through a 40-hour cooking process just with heat and water, no chemicals, no enzymes. It was completely natural. And it, and it had to be that way, remember, because the first people that were taking this were, were infants. And basically that cooking process that was applied to the non-GMO cornstarch significantly changed the structure of the carbohydrate and really altered the way it broke down. So this super starch, which is what we now call it, is basically something that breaks down slowly and steadily over time and maintains that steady blood sugar for a very long period of time, rather than giving you that quick flash of energy like we detailed before, you know, with your bagels or bananas or, or you know, maltodextrin gels, sugar-based sports drinks. Um, so that's really what super starch is. And this is sort of a dumbed down analogy, but if you think about uh, cooking a carbohydrate in your kitchen, whether it's pasta or rice, when you cook something with heat and water, you can change the structure, you change the texture. So, you know, this is to a much more complex degree, but but basically cooking a carbohydrate can change the properties of it. And, and that's what they did with the super starch. So a couple more things on the super starch, you know, like I mentioned, non-GMO, completely natural, just non-GMO cornstarch, heat and water, and it's gluten free. Jonah, starting in 2008, was able to take in three packets of the UCAN or, thir- or 90 grams, excuse me, of the super starch. Um, prior to sleeping at night, and that would keep his blood sugar steady for eight hours. So he was able to take all that up front, would release slowly while he slept, and his blood sugar was steady for eight hours throughout the night. So it was a huge, huge life-changing moment for the family. You know, Jonah's mom, Wendy, even posted on Facebook the first time that they got eight hours of sleep, consecutive hours of sleep from the time that Jonah was born, because it was such a big deal for them. But then some of the other founders of the company started wondering, you know, what would happen if, if folks without the disease started taking this, you know, all of you here in the audience, myself, Michelle, what would happen if we took this carbohydrate? Because as we already talked about, you know, that, that idea of stabilizing your blood sugar is so important, whether it's for athletic performance, health, fitness, weight management. Um, so some of the other founders of the company, they started reaching out to sport dietitians, um, sports nutritionists, and simply just posing that question, you know, saying, this is what we have. This is what it does for kids with this condition. Do you think it could benefit athletes? One of the first people they spoke to was uh, a gentleman by the name of Bob Sibahar, who was working at the University of Florida at the time as the uh, director of sports performance. And Bob is also the uh, dietitian for the Olympic triathlon team in 2008 in Beijing. So, you know, Bob had worked with a lot of endurance athletes, a lot of uh, team sport athletes. And, and what Bob really told us was that stabilizing blood sugar is what he's trying to do with every single one of his athletes. And from a sports nutrition standpoint, 
there was really a gap in the market because the only way he could do that would be to feed his athletes some type of sugar-based drink or some type of maltodextrin-based product at fairly frequent intervals every 20 to 30 minutes. And, you know, a lot of you guys are probably nodding like, yeah, I've done that before. So what Bob told us was that, you know, if, if what you're saying is true, if you can actually address this issue with a carbohydrate that, that breaks down slowly and keeps blood sugar steady on its own, it's going to be a huge deal for our athletes because they're not going to have to worry about GI distress. They're not going to have to fuel so much and, uh, you know, perhaps miss fueling or, or, you know, be focused on fueling instead of focused on executing their plan or focused on the competition. So he gave us some pretty, um, you know, positive feedback, at least on the idea of this. But, you know, as a dietitian and as somebody who is being pitched products all the time, he said, you guys also have to put some clinical research behind it. So that's really what we ended up doing. In 2009, we did a clinical trial at the University of Oklahoma, and we wanted to test our super starch against maltodextrin because maltodextrin is what the all of the newer sports nutrition products were using as their quote-unquote complex carbohydrate. So uh, you know, I'm talking about your hammers, goo, cliff, power bar, uh, you name it. Um, I mean, flip around the label of any sports nutrition product you'll find at a specialty running, try or bike shop. And one of the first ingredients is likely going to be maltodextrin. So from our vantage point, we said, if we have something that's behaving the same way as maltodextrin, there's no point of formulating this for sports nutrition. Because remember, the only purpose of super starch was to help kids like Jonah originally. Um, but as we'll see here in the next couple slides, um, we in fact did end up having a very positive, um, response, um, when we did a clinical trial and Michelle, I'll let you speak to that, um, here in a second, but first, um, can you give us an idea for those who aren't common of what maltodextrin even is? Yeah. So, you know, maltodextrin, kind of like you were saying, if you flip over any, you know, popular for, uh, sports formula, you'll see maltodextrin. So what it is, it's a, you know, it's a fast acting carbohydrate. Basically, you know, it breaks down really quickly and it's designed to give you that, you know, surge in energy. And, um, you know, if you're looking at the the graph here, you know, comparing the maltodextrin versus the super starch, you know, you take the maltodextrin before working out. So let's say, um, you know, you had that guru, you had that gel before you were, you know, worked out you get that surge in energy. Well, once again, it's followed by that subsequent crash where you can gives you that nice, slow, steady energy, you know, over a period of time. And not only, um, not only is going to, is that going to be important for, you know, how you feel in your performance, but once again, remember when you get that spike in blood sugar, like you're getting with the maltodextrin, you're shutting down your body's ability to burn fat for fuel where the super starch is giving you that, you know, nice, steady, consistent energy. I like to tell people, think about it like you were hooked up to like a glucose drip. You know, you have that energy coming in at exactly the rate that your muscles can use it. And because you're not getting that spike, it doesn't stop your body from utilizing fat for fuel. So you're going to be able, you know, that 100 calories or that 130 calories of UCAN that you're using, you're also going to be able to break down your own body fat for fuel versus constantly having to take that, hundred calories of maltodextrin every, um, you know, 30 minutes to an hour. And one of the, I think the significant things here too, is that, that idea of the calories, the equivalent calories, you know, we're looking here at about a 25 gram dose of maltodextrin versus 25 gram serving of super starch. But, uh, you know, it goes to this whole idea that, that all calories aren't created equal. Can you just speak to that for, for a moment, Michelle, in, in terms of the ability to maintain steady energy on the same amount of calories, you know, that, that idea that, that calories can work differently, even if they're the same quantity of calories. Yeah. And that's something that I think is, is really hard to kind of wrap our brains around and understand. And so many of the sports nutrition guidelines are really based on, um, you know, products like maltodextrin or, you know, fast acting carbohydrates. We've never had something like you can. So, you know, 100 calories of goo and 100 calories of you can work completely differently. So, you know, even though they're both, you know, carbohydrates, like you talked about earlier, it's the way that you can breaks down. It's, you know, it was created using that, you know, heat and water process. It's a really, really big molecule. You know, for example, I believe uh, maltodextrin, if we're, if we're going to get into the chemistry, weighs about 2,000 grams per mole. That's how they measure molecules. Super starch is 500,000 grams per mole. So it's this really, really big molecule, which means it's really easy on your stomach. Big molecules are in and out of your stomach relatively quickly. And um, because it's breaking down so slowly, you're getting that steady, consistent energy where that 100 calories can last you, you know, up to two hours. 
because and it's um, and you're also going to be utilizing your own body fat for fuel. You're literally breaking down your own fat um, into glycerol and triglycerides. It's going to fuel your activity. Where with that maltodextrin, you're not you're not able to do that. You're just dependent on that sugar. You know, you're just using those calories from that sugar. You're not burning fat, and you're constantly having to redose with that sugar. And even if we look at you know kind of the, this graph on on the screen, I think what we're seeing is something that's very familiar to a lot of you. So if, if you know, we ex we said that this is 25 grams of maltodextrin, and if you look at where the blood sugar starts to drop on, on the blue line, you know, it's really right around that 30 or 40 minute mark. So 25 mal grams of maltodextrin is l roughly what's in a typical gel. Your blood sugar starts to drop at 30 to 40 minutes. Suddenly we very quickly realize why do they tell you to take a gel every 30 to 40 minutes? They're not making it up, right? There, there's a reason behind it. And that's, to compensate for that drop in blood sugar. Meanwhile, with the super starch, as we see, um, you know that that blood sugar is still right around baseline um, at that two hour mark. So that's really the rub here. You know, is that on the same amount of calories or the same grams of carbohydrate, you're able to maintain your energy for two to three times as long because it's keeping your blood sugar stable, which is so critical. Um, Michelle, I'll just ask you one last thing on here before we move to the next slide. There's, you know. Even um, when your blood sugar is above baseline, like it is with the maltodextrin, um, you know, past the 30 minute mark, when you start to get that big drop in blood sugar, do you feel some of the symptoms of hypoglycemia, even if you aren't actually below baseline? I was actually going to just touch on that. I wanted to, I was going to interrupt you if you didn't let me talk, but yeah, I was going to say that there is nothing that feels as miserable as your blood sugar crashing. And I imagine that pretty much every, everyone who's listening to this, if they've run, if you've run over an hour, you, you know how that feels. It's, it's terrible and it's kind of scary. And that was one thing that I really, um, you know, as a competitive athlete, really struggled with is just trying to stay ahead of that, um, for lack of a better word, kind of scary feeling. I would get sweaty. I'd feel a little shaky, um, kind of nauseated. And that was one beautiful thing about Generation You Can was I could just run. I could just run and focus on, on running. I never had to worry that I was going to start to feel that dizzy, shaky, scary feeling. So it just, it really lets you just um, focus <laughs> on what you love to do or what your goals are, which is running versus thinking, all right, okay, it's been about 30 minutes. Should I take a gel now? Do I need to wait 10 minutes? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess to answer your question, that was kind of a long way of doing it, but absolutely, you know, I've, I've experienced that those blood sugar lows, even, you know, even sooner than, you know, this graph has, and it's very unpleasant. So, uh, that's, that really is, you know, kind of the, the key uh, aspect uh, of the UCAN science. And, um, you know, it looks like there was another slide in here that, that we were going to show with, uh, insulin levels that appears to be missing from here, but Michelle, I think you could just speak to that. So. If we, I'm going to look for that in the meantime, but how does insulin relate to what we're looking at on the screen and, and what's so significant about the impact of super starch on your insulin levels? Yeah. So, um, you know, I know, are you, are you looking for the, this, the slide? Exactly. With the I'll, I'll pull that slide up. <laughs> just a moment. Yeah. Yep. So, um, Martin's looking for a slide that's going to, that's actually going to show how, um, you're able to utilize and burn more body fat for fuel with you can versus maltodextrin, but just going back to talking a little bit about insulin. So when you take, um, you know, when you take carbohydrates, let's say, you know, you have a bagel, you have that maltodextrin, blood sugar increases. Your body is extremely sensitive to blood sugar increasing. So when your blood sugar increases, you know, your pancreas, you know, secretes a hormone called insulin. Insulin basically tells your body like, oh, right, we got all this sugar. Don't burn fat, burn sugar. We got all the sugar. So it shuts down your body's ability to burn fat for fuel. It shuts down fatty acid oxidation. So once again, you're not burning fat when you've taken in a bunch of, you know, carbohydrates right before working out. And your blood sugar starts to go down. Your, your body is, insulin is basically shuttling that sugar into your cells. So, you know, you're really prone to that, you know, blood sugar low. You might, you know, feel um, dizzy, uh, lightheaded. Also, anytime you take in a lot of, um, you know, simple sugars, or even complex sugars right before working out and during working out, you're going to be really prone to um, GI issues. You know, it's very difficult on your on your system to process a lot of sugar while you're in you know while you're in motion while you're in activity but with super start you're gonna see if you look at that oh there it is okay cool um so yeah so let's talk about this so you can see this huge um so what this was this was 
um, a study they did at the University of Oklahoma. So they had cyclists cycle, um, well, they either took maltodextrin or supercharged 30 minutes before running, and they cycled at 70% of their VO2 max um, for an hour and a half, and then they either took the maltodextrin or supercharged right after activity. And you're gonna see, you see that blue line, that's insulin when they took the maltodextrin. So there's a huge spike of insulin right before, um, you know, activity. Obviously, you know, you're at rest, you take a bunch of carbohydrates, big spike in blood sugar, big spike in insulin. And then after exercise, you're gonna see a much smaller spike in insulin. You definitely have um, some of that suppressed after exercise, but significantly larger spike in insulin with the maltodextrin versus the super starch. I mean, super starch is basically flatlining insulin, you know, before working out, during working out, and then after working out. So, but what does that translate into? So that's that's what's really important. Absolutely, and uh, in our, we're, we're talking about that increased ability to burn and utilize fat, which is really what that low insulin response translates into. Isn't that right, Michelle? Absolutely, yep. You're able to utilize and burn fat for fuel, not only um, during work, working out, but after working out. That was another big thing, um, a big advantage of UCAN that I experienced um, when I used it before working out. And then my blood sugar, when I would finish working out, my blood sugar was significantly more stable post-workout than it had been when I was using a lot of those maltodextrin-based products. And, you know, I think from a practical standpoint, so many of us can relate to that fact of getting done with a tough run. And then, you know, when your blood sugar is low because you've been having those fluctuations throughout the entire workout, then you come home and you eat everything in sight. And if we're talking about getting fit or, or weight management as a, as a runner while you're training, that can be so detrimental to, to getting those fitness gains out of your workout. So, um, you know, that's really, again, where, where UCAN comes in in terms of giving you a steady source of energy that's going to continue, allow you to continue burning fat in that post-workout period. But even if you compare it to something like, you know, chocolate milk, which is being really touted in, in the mainstream media about a, as a, you know, really effective and kind of the ideal recovery tool. Well, Michelle, you know, as a dietitian, when you hear chocolate milk being recommended to somebody that might be trying to lose weight as a recovery option with 20 or 25 grams of sugar, what do you think? Ah, oh, it just makes me sad. I mean, it's, it's just terrible. Um, yeah, because, you know, just like you were talking about, you I, when I worked with um, a lot of um, marathon runners and their, you know, big goal was weight loss. We're you know, doing this. We want to complete our first marathon, but everybody had a weight loss goal. You know, when we sat down and looked at a lot of, um, you know, people's diets, they were taking carbohydrates, you know, taking, say, like a bagel right before running. So they're immediately, you know, having their blood sugar spike, activating insulin and preventing fat loss, preventing their bodies from burning fat. So as they start their activity, they're not burning fat. They're, you know, storing fat. And then as they go through their activity, they were taking goos and gels. So now <laughs> they're not, not only are they not burning fat during their workouts, they're taking in excess of amounts of sugar. Now they're done working out, they would have chocolate milk or some other maltodextrin-based drink. And so then they were spiking their blood sugar post-workout and having their body store fat post-workout. And then what happens post-workout, let's say you have chocolate milk after you work out. You know, what happens 30 minutes after that? You know, your blood sugar is going to spike and then crash. So 30 minutes after that, you're starving and you have a big, you know, heavy meal. So it's it's so counterproductive. You know, the things that are, are being touted, like, oh, these are great post-workout things. They really aren't, um, they really aren't conducive to fat loss and weight loss. They're really actually um, conducive to weight gain. So yeah, it make, as a dietitian, it just, ugh, I cringe. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, hopefully, you know, Michelle, people like you are going to help change a lot of folks' uh, mentalities about this. So let's... um. Let's now, we, we've talked about the science and, and I appreciate you guys sticking with us there because it's really important to, to allow you to understand that we're not just talking about, you know, a product here. We're really talking about a fundamental shift in thinking um, and, and kind of this whole concept of fueling. And, and you can, from a product standpoint, is supports that. But, you know, I think it's important to, to get all that info out there. So, in summary, you know, the, the uniqueness of UCAN, we've talked about this at length, no spike and crash. It's giving you that steady, long-lasting energy. That muted insulin response allows you to, to better utilize fat. And, you know, I think it's important to understand that UCAN is still a carbohydrate. We're not at all demonizing carbs or saying, you know, don't have carbs. Uh, this is not a low-carb uh, necessarily philosophy that we're, we're preaching. Uh, I mean, people can have success utilizing UCAN with low-carb diets, but but it's really about the quality of carbohydrate. And so with UCAN, that's the whole idea. It's, it's, a, it's giving you a steady source of carbohydrate, but 
simultaneously allowing you to utilize and burn fat as well. Um, then I think, you know, the, the, the stomach aspect of it for any of you folks that have tried you can or, or, or have a sensitive stomach, I'd say that's the number one reason why people try the product for the first time. It's a, it's a very, very large molecule, very complex structure and uh, thus gets out of your stomach very quickly. Whereas your simple sugars are, are very small molecules and they're going to sit in that st- in your stomach, cause that bloating, cause that GI discomfort. Um, so that's one of the really, really nice things about you can. And then uh, finally, you know, um, the carbohydrate super starch, it's a completely natural energy source. It's not a stimulant. It's not a supplement. It, it's a food. Um, and, you know, when uh, sports teams buy our product, we have some of the, the top teams. I wish I could say out loud everybody that's actually using you can, but, um, you know, we, uh, w- when they buy it, they actually buy it with their food budget, not their supplement budget. Um, and then finally, it is gluten free as well for anybody um, who that's a consideration for. So let's talk really about how to utilize UCAN now in your training um, and now that we've talked about the science. And, you know, what we're going to talk about here, it doesn't matter whether you're training for a marathon, a half marathon, an Ironman, you're an endurance cyclist. Uh, these, these concepts that we're talking about apply across the board. So if you hear Michelle talking about something, you know, in the context of a marathon, um, just know that what she's saying uh is the same relevance in context of say an Ironman triathlon or, 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 or even a 5k or a 10k, you know, for, for a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about, but we've basically got four different products. Um, and we're really going to focus on the three products that have our super starch in them initially. So that's the, you can fuel the, you can with protein and the, you can snack. So the, you can fuel is simply our carbohydrate plus electrolytes. It comes in six different flavors um, and as well as a plain flavor, just an unflavored version, which is just the carbohydrate, no electrolytes, nothing else. And and that's actually what Jonah takes um, and kids with the glycogen storage disease, if they were to use it, would take. But Michelle, the, you can fuel, um, how do you use that and how do you recommend folks use it in their training? Yeah, so you know, I use the you can fuel daily. I use it before, you know, every run. Um, I use the protein. I use the you can with protein when I'm doing runs that are uh, a little bit longer, about an hour and a half or longer, because I usually run first thing in the morning. But even if I'm just going out for like a 30, 45 minute run, you know, I'll even have a half a scoop to a few, full scoop of the you can because you know I'm starting my run in my day with that you know steady consistent energy. So you know I recommend it for you know all runs. And um, you know when I'm done running, I'll come back and depending on how long I ran, I'll have you know between a half scoop to up to two full scoops if I've done a long run or a workout of the uh, you can with protein. So an important point that Michelle raised is that you know the you can with protein, uh, while people might instinctively think of it as a recovery product because they hear protein, um, is actually very versatile. So it also has the super starch carbohydrate in it, which is what's giving you that that consistent steady energy. And then it has added protein on top. So a lot of people like Michelle just alluded to will actually use it as kind of a breakfast or or, or snack before a long run because protein is going to curb that hunger in the stomach. And then the super starch is going to maintain that steady and consistent energy. Now, I I just realized that for folks that that have never used UCAN before, um, just to to make it clear, this is the UCAN fuel and UCAN with protein. They are powdered drink mixes. So when Michelle's talking about a scoop, you know, it's a powder that you mix with water. And we really encourage people to not think of this as a sports drink. This is liquid food. This is what you're replacing your, uh, you know, perhaps your banana whip, your energy bar, your bowl of cereal, your piece of toast, your gel. This is something that you're consuming about 30 minutes prior to your training. It's very easy on the stomach. And the idea is you get it all in your system at once. And a given serving uh, is going to last you for about an hour or two, depending on on how much you take. You know, if it's a scoop, it might be roughly an hour. If it's a packet, which is equivalent to a scoop and a half, it'll be closer to 90 minutes to two hours. Um, You can certainly load up on multiple scoops. Michelle, I know that's something you've done and played around with to see how much you can take in pre-workout that'll really eliminate the need to fuel for several hours. But um. But maybe give us a little bit of perspective, Michelle, for for like a long run uh, or, or in general, how do, how do you decide how to tweak how much of the you can you take? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you, you definitely alluded that, you know, one one scoop is about an hour and I would encourage people to kind of play around with it a little bit. You know, some people, I've talked to people who can go, you know, an hour and a half on a scoop. I usually, I found, you know, for me, I can do up to two and a half hours on two scoops. Um, but I, I like to take, especially before my long runs and my marathon, you know, I'll, I'll have, a, you know, for the full marathon, I'll have a packet you know, about two hours before, and then I'll have another packet about half an hour before, because I don't, I don't eat a lot before my marathon, you know, that, that's, that's my fuel, the UCAN is my fuel, it's keeping, you know, my energy nice and stable, you know, for just a regular training run, say something that's going to last an hour to an hour and a half, you know, I'll have a packet about 30 to 40 minutes before my run. As I'm saying this, I know there's a lot of people out there that may have sensitive stomachs or feel like, oh, I've always got to get up two hours before I run, you know, I really encourage you to, to try you can, um, you know, closer to when you run, you might be really surprised. That was one thing that was just so awesome for me is that I can have it, you know, even up to 20 minutes before I run and I have zero stomach issues. I used to have to, you know, get up super early and plan out when I was going to eat because I have sens such a sensitive stomach. But, um, you know, I'll have the UCAN before, and then during my marathon, I'll actually have um, a scoop of UCAN at mile 10 and mile 18. And that's all the fuel that I need to use, which is just, you know, that's what I found that works really well for me. But it's so awesome because I used to have to take, you know, four, even up to five or six gels. And, you know, I have to dose you can um, much less frequently, which is really nice. And my energy doesn't go up and down, which is awesome. And, you know, for, for context, what Mich when Michelle's talking about a scoop, a scoop of the you can fuel is roughly 80 calories. So that should put it in context for you. She's, she's replacing you know, five gels, say roughly 500 to 550 calories during her marathon with two scoops of UCAN, roughly 160 or so calories. Uh, and, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm just going to reduce my calories. If, if you felt crummy, who would, who would do that? It doesn't make sense. But the, the key is that the performance is not suffering. It's actually, you know, Michelle's gotten better and better and better um, over the years. Uh, so th that's really the idea with UCAN. It's not just this idea of, cutting calories because in theory you and you could do that with any product it's really this idea of being able to cut calories but not sacrificing your energy and your performance um, and I think the other great point that you raised Michelle is, is this uh, idea of being able to take this closer to the time of your run because you know you as a dietitian you realize the importance of fueling and so you're gonna wake up you know an hour or you were waking up an hour and a half or two hours before to make sure you had enough time to eat but I can't tell you how many people I talk to that have that same dilemma that you were having and just instead of waking up several hours early, they just don't fuel before a run, you know, and that can be, uh, I mean, that can just lead to, to bad workouts that can lead to like just being ravenously hungry after your workout. I mean, there's certainly a place for fasted training, but I mean, if you're doing that on a consistent basis, you're probably not getting the most out of your workouts as possible. Um, Michelle, in terms of using UCAN during as well, I think another thing to touch on is the amount of fluid, you know, with, with, so with maltodextrin products, they tell you that you need to chase a gel with a specific amount of fluid to aid digestion. But you can is very different in that regard, right? Yeah, you know, that was one thing that was really nice was I didn't have to be as concerned about how much, um, you know, fluid I was taking with you can and I would certainly, you know, encourage anybody who's going to use it in a race, you would want to, you know, train with it. But, you know, I was able to really concentrate my UCAN, um, and I've, I've done it two different ways. I've, I've made it into that, you know, basically kind of like a paste, almost like a gel, and carried it with me. And then I've had it, you know, handed to me, you know, in a water bottle. But at both times, it was very concentrated and, um, you know, had zero, zero stomach issues and um, just continued with that same steady energy. So that was another thing that was really, really nice. Kevin had a question that I think is uh, relevant to address at this time. So let me just uh, pose it to the group and then we can discuss. So Kevin says, I'll be running my 21st Boston Marathon in less than two weeks. Congratulations, Kevin. That's awesome. We will, uh, we will be in Boston. So please make sure to come check us out at the expo. It'll be great to meet you. Um, he said, recently within the last three to four years, I've experienced major GI distress and the need to go about halfway during my marathon. <laughs> After trying UCAN a few times, I've noticed tremendous results. What do you re what do you recommend to fuel for the marathon, pre race and during? And then he says, "Well, I'm not an elite athlete. I have the build of an elite runner, uh, very light with about three percent body fat." Um, and so, Michelle, so what, well, I'll pose the second part of his question to you next. But just in general, uh, what would a recommendation for someone be 
in terms of a marathon routine. And, and maybe you can get even pretty specific with what you do, even in terms of that breakfast. Um, yeah, before a marathon. Sure. Yeah, and I think you I think you have two options, you know, when you want to use you can for a really long effort, you know, some people feel really good about um, they want they want to eat something they, they're used to having you know something small in their stomach. So they'll get up a few hours before and have a small breakfast, you know, be like a small bowl of oatmeal. I always encourage people to have at least some fat or protein with that. You know, I, I worked with somebody that had, you know, an English muffin with peanut butter. Um, you know, about two hours before, and then about an hour before, they would have a packet of you can or, you know, two scoops of you can before. So, I mean, that certainly is one option is to get, you know, something small if you, if you feel like you want that real food in your system, and then have that you can, um, you know, before, you know, about 30 minutes before your effort. And then, you know, once you, once you start running, you know, a packet last, uh, you know, last about 75 to 90 minutes. So, depending on how, how long you're going to be out there, you could certainly dose dose that way. You know, I found for me, like I said, at about mile 10 and about mile 18, you know, a scoop was was perfect. That was enough to get me through. I had steady energy, no bonking, and I felt great. So, um, so you, know, you could certainly, you know, <laughs> follow my lead. Um, and the nice thing about you can, I feel like too, is, you know, I've had people say they err a little bit on the safe side. They, they have a little bit, you know, oh, if I have a scoop and a half, is that going to hurt me versus a scoop? You know, it certainly won't hurt you. You know, you can, not going to spike your blood sugar. So if you have, you know, a little bit more, um, you know, that's not going to make you spike and crash. Um, you know, for myself personally, I just, I've always struggled with eating before, working out. I just have a super sensitive stomach. So I just load up on the UCAN. And like I said earlier, I'll have, you know, a packet of UCAN about two hours before. I usually do, I do the chocolate with protein and I'll make a little bit of a smoothie out of it. I'll put some nut butter in it, um, you know, some unsweetened almond milk. And then about half an hour before I'll have a, another packet and it'll just be the UCAN um, without the protein. I usually use the orange, um, a packet of that. And then at mile 10 and at mile 18, I'll have a scoop of just the uh, the orange, so that, you know, without protein. And of course, you know, every few water stops, uh, you know, I'm always making sure that I'm taking in some water, but, you know, I haven't found that I, um, you know, even have to use electrolytes, but then again, I haven't raced anywhere that's super hot. <laughs> so, um, so that's, that's what I do. That's my, that's my strategy. And, and to speak to that point on, on electrolytes, Michelle, the, um, you know, the, the you can fuel and the you can with protein does have electrolytes. I think it's roughly in a packet about 180 milligrams of sodium, 140 milligrams of potassium. So somewhere in that range. Uh, but if you are somebody that that's a heavy sweater or racing in the heat, that's really where the, you can hydrate comes in. So that's a zero calorie electrolyte replacement, no sugar, just sodium, about 350 milligrams of sodium and a hundred uh, milligrams of potassium uh, per serving. So that's something that you could even add to your UCAN fuel um, to, up, to up the electrolyte content, or it's something that you could just sip on in between doses of the UCAN fuel if you are a heavy sweater and, and want to get just the salts in your system, but but don't want the added sugar from, from the Gatorade. Um, now, Michelle, in, in terms of the logistics, I have a few people asking here. Um, I think you've raced marathons with UCAN both as an elite where you have the elite tables and as, um, you know, just as, as uh, I guess, a regular runner to, for lack of a better <laughs> term. Um, when you don't have the elite tables, how have you gone about carrying it with you or, or getting it in um, at mile 10 or 18? Because I know that's a concern for a lot of folks, especially folks that are that are faster, but, you know, you're very fast yourself and you've made it work. Well, how, you. how have you done it? Yeah. Um you know, and depending on how much you can, you're going to use, I, you can certainly uh, make it into the, like, 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 basically like a, like a paste. What I've done is, you know, you can take, you know, a scoop of you can, I'll just scoop it out into like a bowl and I'll add just a little bit of water and I'll keep stirring until it becomes almost like a, like a, I'm trying to think of the consistency. It's it's like a just basically like a paste, for lack of a better word. And then I've, I'll put that in a plastic baggie. You know, and I made two of those because um, I was going to have one at mile um, ten and one at mile eighteen. And then you know I'm a female. I'll just keep it in my sports bra. You know, you could certainly keep it in you know your pockets, shorts if you have um, you know whatever you're running in. But it makes it really easy to carry. You know, it's super lightweight. It's it's truly you know no more light, no more heavy than a, a gel. So, you know, that's something that I would, I would recommend doing. And then once you hit that point where you want to have your UCAN again, um, you know, I just basically bite off the end of the plastic bag and kind of, you know, squeeze it out like I would a gel. 
um, you know, it is you it is um, a little bit thicker in consistency than a gel is. So I would definitely encourage you know people to practice that. Um, and usually I'll make sure I'm I'm by a water step when I do that because I'm gonna you know squeeze into my mouth, take a shot of water, and keep going. And that shot of water is not really for digestion as much as it is just to kind of wash it down and for mouthfeel, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, theoretically, you wouldn't even have to take take the water if you didn't want to. For me, it's because um, the you can you know consistency is is relatively thick. It's just to kind of wash my mouth out and keep going. Um, and for Kevin, who who asked this, how do you make it into a gel? Kevin, what I'm going to send this out as part of the follow up when you guys get a recording. Uh, we had a, an ambassador that actually just made a great video showing uh, how exactly she makes you can into a gel. But the basic idea is you would just add a small amount of water to the Yukon and, and really, you know, either with a fork or, or just kind of really stirred up, uh, really, really thick, um, or, or sorry, stirred up, you know, very vigorously as you're adding the water to it. And once you get that consistency that you like, then you can just transfer it into whatever you want to carry it in, whether it's a small gel flask or, or a plastic baggie. Um, so that that's kind of what a lot of people have done. I've heard other people that have taken a, a scoop or a packet and, and put like two or three ounces of water and, and blended it up in like a Vitamix or something like that if you really want to to smooth it out. But of course, that's not always realistic if you're traveling to a race or in a hotel. So that's basically the, the way you would do that. And I'll send out some more info in the follow-up about how exactly to do that. Uh, let's see. We had another question from uh, Gary. So Gary wanted to know, oh, this is a good one. Gary wanted to know, how long does it take to get back into fat burning mode if you trip your blood sugar's insulin level? So I'm, I'm assuming he means if you cause that spike. Um, how would you answer that, Michelle? I don't know if there's a concrete, it takes X number of <laughs> minutes, but but it, conceptually, how do you answer that? Um, yeah, and I guess there, there's, so, there's so many different scenarios, you know, whether, I don't know if he's talking about, um, like, let's say you had a bunch of like a bagel before running or, or we, I don't know if we're talking after running, but, um, so I guess that would kind of depend, right? Yeah, um, it would kind of depend. I mean, it can take anywhere from, I mean, it can be relatively quick if you, you know, you're kind of coming off of that, you're coming, you know, down, um, you know, from a blood sugar spike. And if you're able to, to maintain your blood sugar, let's say you're, you know, you're coming off a, you're basically crashing for lack of a better word. And then you started, you know, to, to feel with something that wasn't going to spike your, um, blood sugar and your insulin levels, you, your body kick back into it relatively quickly. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if you're if you just ate something very dense and simple sugars or, or carbohydrates that was going to cause your blood sugar to spike, I mean, it might take you several hours um, to, to consistently teach your body how to utilize fat for fuel. You know, we've seen people be able to um, burn fat at higher intensities. Um, you know, over a relatively quick period over. 15 days, people are able to become more efficient at fat burning, which is, is really cool and really encouraging. I guess the other part of it is that, you know, if, if you do get that spike in blood sugar while, and then your blood sugar drops back where you are in fat burning mode, the, the issue might be that if your blood sugar is low or, or if you've experienced that big drop in blood sugar while you may be in fat burning mode, you're just not going to feel good, right? And that's why you're going to take in, you're going to be inclined to take in that gel and spike again. It, it really comes back to the way that that up and down, up and down, up and down effect makes you feel more than anything. Because if you don't feel good, you're gonna you're gonna do something about it. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I work with clients who aren't necessarily athletic, um, you know, let's say you had, you know, um, a donut at ten o'clock. You know, your blood sugar is gonna spike and crash within, you know, thirty minutes to an hour. And even though you you have plenty of calories on board. I mean, you may have had anywhere between three and 500 calories. Your blood sugar is so low that your, your body is basically telling, you know, like, oh my gosh, we need more food. We need more food. Even though you have, you know, plenty of calories there, theoretically, you're just, you're feeling terrible. Last product I want to talk a little bit about um, is the Ucan snack bar. So the Ucan snack bar is, um, you know, conceptually similar to the fuel and the protein in the sense that it has the super starch as the primary carbohydrate. Um, it also has some protein, fiber, and fat, um, in you know, which which will help curb that hunger. Um, and it's got a small amount of sugar. I think roughly about five grams of sugar per bar. Uh, the Ucan fuel and the Ucan protein don't have any sugar. Uh, this one does to just kind of hold everything together. Um, how have you found the uh, Ucan snack bars have fit into your plan, Michelle? Whether it's in training or for racing. 
Um, yeah, you know, the UCAN snack bars are really great because, you know, so many snacks that we have nowadays are, don't really, don't really satiate you, you know. Um, you know, we have lots of different granola bars and protein bars out there. And I found for, for me, the UCAN snack at about two or three o'clock in the afternoon is fantastic. You know, that really holds me over if I have a second training session in the afternoon um, or, you know, if I'm just <laughs> being held over till dinner, you know, it's really nice to keep your blood sugar and your energy really stable. You know, I work with a lot of um, triathletes that love the UCAN snack bar. You know, they'll use it um, before training. They'll even use it, you know, on, during races, um, you know, to really curb their hunger when you really want to eat something tangible. And even, you know, runners and um, uh, marathon runners and half marathon runners that I work with like to use it, you know, before training or even, you know, after training is kind of, you know, a healthy snack. It gives you that coconut oil, makes you feel satiated and you get that, you know, some of that steady energy from the super starch. And that's something also that, you know, a lot of people are inclined to wake up and have something like a cliff bar or a powered bar that often have 15 or 20 grams of sugar before training. Um, the you can snack bar is really something that supports all the principles that we've been talking about, which is blood sugar control, steady energy. Uh, it off also offers you that, that satiety aspect. So, um, you know, really something great to have, uh, you know, on, on marathon race day, when you first wake up as breakfast, you could, you could have it, you know, an hour before a long run and then pair it with some of the, you can fuel, um, in, in order to, you know, really extend that energy out for a long run. So, um, so yeah, you can play around with it and certainly use it in the way, uh, Michelle has, uh, stated as well, just in between meals to, to really hold you over by controlling your blood sugar. Um, we're just going to go a, a couple more minutes here. Just wanted to chat about one last thing. Um, you know, Michelle, one of the things that you you just touched on, um, which I thought was kind of a perfect segue into this slide, was really um, that idea of, of people having consumed lots of calories but still feeling hungry or still feeling a lull in energy. And I think this chart kind of says it all. And, and really the quote below it uh, from Dr. Kathy Eckel, who, who researches the human metabolism at Yale University, she says, it's really the ability to maintain blood sugar that sustains energy levels. So from a fitness standpoint, UCAN is huge because it does that without putting lots of calories on board. It's really beneficial because you can make every calorie count. So if, if we go back to the traditional calorie recommendations, you know, they're all in an effort to stabilize your blood sugar. It's not necessarily that you need those calories. Uh, and that's what sometimes takes people a, a little bit of time to wrap their mind around with, with you can is that, you know, you guys are recommending I take one packet for a 90 minute run, which is 130 calories for that same run. I might've previously had an energy bar and sipped on a sports drink throughout, which is, you know, 300 calories, or I might've had, you know, three gels, one before and one every 30 minutes. Um, so that's where people get confused. But uh, you know, and, and sometimes even tend to overfuel with UCAN, but but really what's happening here is it's twofold, right? The, the calories in UCAN are released slowly over time, um, so they're distributed evenly and, and keep your blood sugar steady. That's exactly what Kathy's quote pertains to, and, and they also allow you to burn significantly more of your own fat. So if we're able to utilize more of our fat calories, then it stands to reason that we don't need as many excess calories to fuel our workout. So that's what people have really seen. You know, they've seen that they're able to replace three gels with a serving of UCAN because it's a much more calorie efficient fuel source. Uh, Michelle, the last thing I really wanted to chat with you about, you know, we've talked a lot about racing uh, and, and kind of your race day protocol, but, but really want to highlight the fact that UCAN's power is as a training tool. You know, it's, it's something that'll really allow people to change their metabolism and become more efficient in the training process. Can you just speak to that idea, you know, as somebody who's, who's worked with athletes and trained competitively, competitively yourself, how important is it to get the maximum out of your training, you know, from a nutrition standpoint uh, versus what you do on race day? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, you know, what you do, you know, every single day is what prepares you, you know, for race day. You know, you don't, get to a marathon and after running three or four times, I mean, you've trained for weeks, months, you know, often years. And so, you know, what you, what you do consistently is what, you know, changes your body and what makes your body great. You know, I found it was so interesting to me that, you know, people get really, really worked up and concerned about, oh my gosh, what am I going to have on race day? What am I going to do? And, you know, my response is often like, 
what what have you been doing all this time you know with you can you know that's why i tell people you know this is really something you want to be using every single day you know when you use this daily when you have this for your training you are teaching your body you know how how to utilize fat for fuel how to properly you know utilize process these carbohydrates keep your blood sugar stable break down your own body fat and you're teaching your you know your gut you're teaching everything how how to work properly and for um for your training and so you know when you do that over time you teach your body how to burn fat you teach your um you know metabolism how to work correctly it's so it's it's so much more beneficial than just saying oh this is something that i use before a long run or before you know a race so you know i absolutely recommend like if people ask me like what's the best way to use you can well you know I would always say, you know, if you're only going to use it once, I would use it before your training. Because once again, you're teaching your body how to utilize fat for fuel. You're fueling your workouts. You're going to be strong during your runs. You're going to finish your runs feeling good. You know, if you're able to use it twice, I would say before and after your workouts. Because then when you're finishing your workout, you know, you have a scoop or a packet of that you can after. It's keeping your blood sugar and energy stable, you know, for hours beyond your workout. And, you know, you're refueling you with the protein, the electrolytes. Um, and then, you know, as you can see on this slide, it can be a fantastic meal replacement. You know, I work with a lot of busy professionals that will use the UCAN um, and add, you know, a little bit of fruit and nut butter, and it gives them steady, consistent energy for hours versus, you know, grabbing junk or fast food. So, you know, you know, in summary, using it before your workout, you're going to have a great workout, steady, consistent energy, burning fat for fuel. After your workout, you're going to be, you know, replacing some of those electrolytes that you've lost. Um, I always use the protein after I work out, you know, get the protein. And then if you're able to, or if you want to replace a meal, or you can have it as a healthy snack, you know, that's certainly another option. And, you know, I think to, to just to put a bow on what Michelle just said so well, it's it's really, you know, you can as a tool to keep your blood sugar stable. And, and when Michelle alludes to the fact that you can use it in all these different ways, it's really because you always want to keep your blood sugar stable. So it's, you know, I think ultimately we are here to give you ideas on all the ways you can use it and, and you'll figure out where it makes sense in your day, you know, and certainly it's, it's, it's a convenient option to keep your blood sugar stable because many grab and go items do not support steady blood sugar. So in some of these instances, you might say, Hey, I'm going to try to achieve this desired effect from pairing food together, you know, having a balanced meal with fat, uh, protein and and controlling your carbohydrate intake, but but in other scenarios, you know, from a, like like Michelle said, if there's one time to use it, it's really pre-exercise because there's really no food that's going to make you feel how you can does, and and that comes back to the origins. Remember, when they were searching for a carbohydrate for Jonah, they were looking at all different carbohydrates that would stabilize blood sugar the longest, and they eventually found it to be super starch. So. From a from a blood sugar maintenance and from an energy standpoint for your training, there's there's really nothing that compares. Um, so yeah, I, you know, definitely try it in, in a bunch of different situations. See what makes sense for you. But if you're going to only use it in one way, really try it as a as a pre exercise snack prior to your workout. You'll you'll really feel that difference. Um, so you know, all you folks uh, will be getting um, you know a packet of the UCAN Fuel, the Tropical Orange flavor, a, a UCAN Hydrate Stick, and a UCAN Snack Bar. You'll be getting the three different products. Um, a sample of them that you'll be able to try and, and just stay tuned. You know, those will be available. You guys will all be getting information here in the next day or so um, on when those exactly will be available at, at your uh, local specialty retail shop. But it should really give you a good chance to uh, to experience everything and, and to try everything out. And, you know, just a tip uh, with you, can if, if you're using the powders, it is a starch. So cold water, give it a good hard shake. Um, and that'll really yield the best taste and the consistency. Uh, Michelle, I'll give you the final word. Uh, you summed it up pretty nicely just there, but anything else we didn't talk about, anything else that you'd like to add before we sign off today? Gosh, no, I think, I think we, we pretty much covered everything. I definitely, um, you know, I encourage everybody to try it before they're wrong. Um, and just like, you know, just like with training and anything else, you know, you certainly don't get, you know, fit and lean by trying something once or twice. You definitely have to, to be consistent. So if you're really looking to improve your times, you're looking to lose some weight, whatever your goals are, you know, I would really recommend giving you can the full, I say, you know, within 10 to 14 days, you're really going to notice a difference in, um, you know, fat burning, how you feel. You certainly should notice you should feel good and consistent that first time you try it. But, you know, after about a week, I think you'll be sold. 
Well, awesome, Michelle. It's always great to, to have you on. Always great to pick your brain. Uh, love doing it. So uh, don't be a stranger. We hope to have you on here again. And uh, for everybody that joined us today, I uh, really appreciate your time. You'll be getting uh, an email from me here in the next hour or so with a full recording of this session. Um, you'll also be getting some info in the upcoming days on, on how to get your UCAN samples. But you know, in the meantime, uh, everyone will have my email from the recording. So if you have any questions, any clarity on what we talked about, feel free to, uh, to give me a shout. And, and again, you're, you're able to watch this at your leisure. If there's anything you missed, if you jumped on later, if there's anything you want to understand further, uh, you will have the full recording. So with that being said, I'm Varn Sriram, joined by Michelle Hearn, registered dietitian, marathoner, and really appreciate you all joining us today. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. Thanks.